We'll be back in our study of John this morning, so if you'll join me in John chapter 4. What an absolutely beautiful song that is. As we return to our study of the, the Gospel of John, I want to just kind of put at the forefront of our mind what we uh, have seen, what we, where we last were. We spent several weeks looking at a, a most important conversation between a, a very outwardly religious and righteous man named Nicodemus and our Lord. We learned of the important truth of our need to be born again, and how, no matter how righteous and religious we perceive ourselves to be, that we can do nothing that will merit salvation of our own accord. We need to be born again. We learned as well of God's incredible love for the whole world in sending His Son, and that Christ came to this earth to be lifted up as the serpent was in the wilderness, we learned a lot in chapter 3. Now as we turn to chapter 4, we want to be reminded once again that John's whole focus and his whole point here in all of the interactions is to draw out that truth that, that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, so that we would believe and be saved but I also want to remind ourselves of chapter 1 telling us that when Jesus or when John professes and confesses that we have seen his glory, glory is of the only of the Father, full of grace and truth. But that's the Jesus that we will see in page after page of this gospel, certainly through all of the gospels, but that's uniquely true in the gospel of John. He is full of grace and truth. We're going to look at the interaction between Jesus and the woman at the well. And I know that this is a very familiar story to us all. As such, there are a few temptations before us this morning. For me, the temptation would be to try to find something in this passage that's never before been seen or heard and bring you something new and fresh and exciting or to take this passage out of its context and morph and mold it to say something, again, new and fresh that you've never heard before. But for you, the temptation this morning would also be to, to tune out, because you've probably read this passage many times or heard a thousand sermons on Jesus and the woman at the well. Or perhaps you'd be tempted to try to compare this sermon to sermons that you've heard in the past, whether that's for better or for worse. If it's worse, don't tell me, okay? Thank you. But for both of us, I want to call us this morning, whatever the temptation may be, to avoid those temptations and instead with, with, with new eyes and with fresh eyes to see the incredible grace of our Savior in these pages. I was telling the people in Sunday school this morning the passage that we had before us in Sunday school and this one as well, they're very challenging, but they're also very encouraging. And I want to say, hopefully this doesn't need to be said, but whenever I prepare a sermon and the way that I preach, the way I think about preaching, my, my goal, my aim is never, how can I make people feel as bad as possible? How can I just make people miserable and discouraged so that they'll leave church just feeling like they're not even a Christian? How can I do that? That's not my goal, I promise. Uh, my goal is, number one, to be faithful to the text so that I can honor our Lord that way, but also to not hide us from the truth that's there that reveals to us who we are, even as Christians so that we will be reminded and ever stand in awe of the grace of God shown towards us in Christ. I have that in mind because Deuteronomy chapter 6 lays before us this principle where God is speaking, or he, there is an admonition rather to the people of Israel 
as you enter the promised land, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God and forget that he brought you from Egypt, from slavery. He's saying, lest you enjoy the good things in the land, and then you forget God and forget where you came from. So we need to be reminded from the Egypt that God has rescued us from so that we don't forget God and that we will ever stand in awe of him and be quick and eager to walk in obedience towards him. We're also tempted to, to read the scriptures and read ourselves into the hero role of every story, aren't we? We're always the one confronting the Pharisee. We're never the Pharisee. This text is often taught, used to teach on evangelism. But I, I want to say that what is so clear to me in this passage and hopefully clear to you is that we're the woman in this passage. We are not the good guy. We are the immoral, the no-name, ashamed, guilty woman like this Samaritan woman in this passage. And I hope that we'll be reminded of that so that we can be reminded of the grace of God shown towards us in Jesus. Our text is going to be John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. If you would stand as we read, we're going to go from verses 1 through 15. And we'll cover the rest, Lord willing, at a later time. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Let's pray. Father, as we turn to your word, I, I just want to um, confess in my need for you uh, to preach this faithfully and accurately, Lord, to get to the heart of what's happening here, to not try to bring out fresh and new things that no one's heard of before, but just to be faithful to the text, Lord. I need your help. We need your help to hear your word. I pray that you would bless the preaching and the hearing of your word, that we would all come to this inexhaustible well of living water, and drink deeply this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. It's good for Christians to look at this text and still put themselves in the role of the woman because like the first song that we sang said, our hearts are prone to wander. They are prone to pursue anything but our Lord, and we need to be reminded that Jesus is greater. We're going to begin by just looking here at the setting that John sets before us uh, in verses 1 through 6. This is the setting. Uh, this is a point in Jesus' life where he's really starting to become 
more well-known. John writes that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. You'll remember that in chapter 1, the Pharisees were not a a fan of, of John preaching out in the wilderness and making disciples, but evidently they were even less fond of Jesus now doing the same thing and growing in popularity. After all, why would they be fond of him if they were if Jesus was rising to a better, higher level of prominence than John the Baptist, that would give them an opportunity to discount John the Baptist's message, who was constantly also telling them to repent and calling them a brood of vipers. But, if you remember in chapter 2, what did Jesus do? He went into the temple and turned over the tables and threw out the money changers, proclaimed himself to be the temple They might not like John, but they like Jesus even less. Jesus has quickly found himself on the bad side of the Pharisees. We can almost sense the seedlings of hatred beginning to sprout in the hearts of the Pharisees that will eventually be in full bloom, which will lead them to crucify our Lord. Jesus knows all about the Pharisees, and so he decides to leave Judea and Galilee and head for Galilee. See, it wasn't Jesus' time yet. Jesus was, had a particular time in mind that he would be crucified, and it was not now. So he leaves. They head for Galilee. And verse 4 tells us that he had to pass through Samaria. That's, every time we see anything that Jesus had to do or Jesus must do, it's almost difficult to see that and to read that Jesus doesn't have to do anything on one level, right? However, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, it wasn't because this was the only route from Judea to Galilee. Historians say that there were actually three routes, three popular routes, one that would go all the way around Samaria to the right, and one that would go around Samaria to the left, and one that went straight through Samaria. This was the shortest way, but he didn't have to choose this direction, especially as a Jew. As you know, this this passage is going to talk about, it talks about a Samaritan woman. You know that the Jews did not like the Samaritans, and so there were many rabbis and Jews who would choose the long way around Samaria so as to not walk through the land of the defiled. Why is this? What was the the source of this hatred? Just a really brief history about that. You can read about it uh, several places throughout the Old Testament, but dating all the way back to approximately 722 B.C. when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, this is where we start to see Samaria becoming uh, what they are known for during this time. See, if If you didn't know, Israel was split into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom, and then there was the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. The northern kingdom was made up of ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, and Judah was made up of two, just Benjamin and Judah, two tribes in the southern kingdom. So clearly the southern kingdom of, of Judah was much smaller, but they had the holy city. They had Jerusalem. The northern kingdom did not, so they made a, their own capital. They made, eventually, over time, they made their own temple there. There was a particular king who uh, put his own temple, they built their own temple for the worship of God on a different mount than where it was supposed to be. But what happened is whenever these, these kingdoms were split, the northern kingdom was ransacked and by the Assyrians, and they transported basically everyone out and brought in a bunch of people who were from unclean nations. They were not Israelites. They were Gentiles. More specifically, they were pagans, and they brought in all of their false gods. And what happened is some of the remnant Israelites who were there started to intermarry. And so the Samaritans are viewed as this unclean mixed race, not to mention heretics, because they had this mixed religion of a little bit of Judaism and a lot of paganism. They viewed the first five books of the Bible as, as true and right, as inspired scripture, but they rejected the prophets and they rejected the Psalms. So they had a sense of morality. 
they had a sense of law keeping, but it was mixed with a lot of paganism. And so over time, the Jews grew in their hatred for the Samaritans. They were viewed as very un, as ceremonially unclean people. So they would look for every opportunity to not deal with the Samaritans. Why? Because they didn't want to be defiled. They didn't want to be defiled by the Samaritans. So there were many people who were very pious, who would go from Judea to Galilee and apparently would go the long way all to get to Galilee so that they didn't have to go through the land of Samaria and be defiled by these people who were very despised. These were people who would be viewed as lower and less than. There was some real racial hostility here, some real racism going on between the Jews and the Samaritans. But here is Jesus, and it says that he had to go through Samaria. Jesus is breaking these customs immediately. Why? Because, as you know, he had a meeting with a certain woman. The word had to here is the same word that we saw in chapter 3 that said the Son of Man must be lifted up. It, it indicates to us the divine purpose, divine providence behind an action that Jesus had to do this because this was God's plan. Why? Because there was a certain woman that he needed to speak with to bring to faith. Isn't, isn't this amazing that before the foundations of the world, that this day was in the mind of God, this moment. And so now God in the flesh is walking this earth and he's saying, I must go through this land of the unclean because I must meet with this woman because today is the day of salvation. Isn't that incredible? What about your day? Think about all of the things that went into the day that you were saved. Everything that had to happen for that day, that moment to happen. God is absolutely in control of everything. And every single right turn, every left turn, every cloud in the sky is uniquely ordered by God to bring about his sovereign purposes, namely to save his people, to cause them to persevere after he has saved them. They go through Samaria. They come to this city called Sychar. This particular field, Jesus takes a seat at Jacob's well. His well is still there today, and it's fed by a spring that keeps the water fresh and cold. This was a most important site for the Samaritans. As we said a bit ago, the, the Samaritans only recognized the first five books of the Bible, so they were very indeed, they were definitely important to them. This, this history in the first five books of the Bible is very important to them. And it would seem that the history of the patriarch Jacob buying this field and making this well gave the Samaritans some sense of pride in their national heritage. We'll see that play out a little bit more whenever the woman comes into the, the picture. But for now, we see John bring out the reality of Jesus's Humanity. What does he say? Jacob's well was there, verse 6. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It's about the sixth hour. We introduced an important theological term early on in this study, and I'm sure that every one of you has used it every day since. Uh, it was the hypostatic union. Everyone said, oh yeah, definitely. I named my child hypostatic union. Um, please don't do that. We learned that that term is referring to the union of the two natures in the person of Jesus Christ, the human nature and the divine nature, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And in chapters one through three, we got a heavy dose of the fully God part of his nature. But now we see the fully human aspect of our Lord's nature, don't we? He was wearied. What does that mean? He, he was tired. It was a long journey. And our Savior, the one who upholds the world by the word of his power, was tired. 
the way that the Jews would have kept time, a, a day begins at 6 a.m., so the sixth hour would have been noon. This is high noon. The sun is right overhead. The journey has been long. It's hot. Jesus is tired. I love that Hebrews teaches us that our Savior can sympathize with us in our weakness because he experienced the frailty of our humanity when he took on flesh. Here we see it. Just Mary, chapter 1, verse 1, with this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus was tired. It's amazing what our Savior endured, the, the, the condescension of our Savior to save us, and here in this particular place to serve this immoral adulteress. As we examine Jesus' physical object lesson here, he uses this object lesson to point to a greater spiritual reality. We begin by seeing Jesus make a shocking petition in verse 7. A, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. We're introduced to the woman who Jesus had to come through Samaria to speak with. She's a Samaritan, and she's a woman, and she's most likely a social outcast. You know this passage. You know that Jesus goes on to confront her in, in her immorality. She says that she has had, Jesus tells her, points out to her that she has had five husbands, and she's living with a man now that's not even her husband. This is a, a sexually immoral woman. Remember, they had the law of Moses. They, they would have had a sense of morality. They would have had a sense of, uh, of in the law where it tells, it, it is told to the people that the only provision for divorce is what? It was adultery. And this woman has gone through five marriages and she's now with a man that she's not even married to. All of these hints tell us that she's most likely a sexually immoral woman. And here she is talking to God in the flesh. And he's asking her for a drink of water. Not only is she sexually immoral, it's a woman. It was very, very taboo for a rabbi to speak with a woman in public. They, they would have been, people that could see it would immediately think, there were actually Historians say that there were actually customs that if a man spoke in public with a woman alone for more than a certain amount of minutes, people would automatically assume that they had relations. That's how serious it was. But here is our Savior speaking with a woman alone, and he has designed this conversation to take place where they will be alone. And she's a Samaritan. She practices a false religion. She's sexually immoral. Her race is seen in un as unclean. And the Savior of this world asks her for a drink of water. We know she must have been a social pariah because of her history with men that Jesus will go on to list. And also because she's coming out to draw water alone at a time apart from when women typically would go draw water. Depending on who, what historian you're, you're reading, they will say that it was either early in the morning or early in the evening. Either way, the idea was that they would go out to water. The women would often together in groups when the sun was lower, so it was nice and cool. It wasn't in the middle of the heat of the day. And here's this woman alone, and she's going out in the middle of the day She's expecting there to be nobody there. She doesn't want to be seen. Maybe she's avoiding the stares and the insults that she receives when all the other women are there at the well. This is the kind of woman who probably has not had her life turn out the way that maybe she thought it would. She isn't accepted by her community. The men that she has loved have left her. This is the kind of woman who would have a strong sense of all that has gone wrong in her life. And as she walks out to the well alone in the midday sun to draw some water to quench her thirst, you get the sense that this is almost symbolic. That it's symbolic for the many wells 
that she has gone to draw water from to quench the, the thirst of her soul, her emotional thirst, her relational thirst. All the while, she has been left more and more thirsty after every well she visits. But little does she know that the incarnate Son of God, the God-man, is at the well waiting for her. That he had to come see her. And he looks at her, tired as he is, and he says, give me a drink. Give me a drink. John gives us a, this parenthetical statement letting us know that the disciples, they'd been sent off into the town to buy some food. Isn't that interesting? How many disciples does it take to get a sandwich? I would want to suggest to you that we find here the first biblical example of Baptists making big committees to handle, handle simple tasks. Rimshot. It's a joke. This is just further evidence, though, that Jesus wanted to be alone. He sent all of his disciples away to go and get food from the Samaritans. He wanted to be alone. Could you imagine if his disciples had been around when this woman came to the well? They, they will eventually come, and they will eventually, no doubt, have their questions and wonder what's going on. But if they had been there, it would not have been the environment conducive to the kind of soul work the Lord wanted to do in this woman's heart. Because of the long, bitter history between Jews and Samaritans, the woman is shocked by Jesus' request for water. How is it that you, a Jew, you're asking for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Literally, what that means is Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. They don't share dishes with Samaritans. Here is Jesus in front of this sexually immoral woman, a part who is a part of this unclean race. She's a woman. They're alone. And he's asking her for a drink from her bucket, from her cup, whatever tools she has out there with her. He's asking to drink from her bucket. This is highly unheard of. This would be a quick way to defile yourself to be ceremonially unclean. We know that Jesus confronts uncleanness all the time, and he purifies what's unclean. And she can't believe her ears here. She's probably thinking how strange it is that a man is talking to her in public at all. During that time, as I said, it was very inappropriate to be caught in public talking to a woman alone. This is a very scandalous scene you can get a sense of that just in her question. I mean, Jesus asked for a drink of water. Is it really that big a deal? Yeah, actually, this was a huge deal. Jesus did not concern himself, though, with that at all, does he? He doesn't allow things that would trip everyone else up to stand in his way. His disciples wouldn't do this. Rabbis most certainly would not do this. These unclean people were viewed as their enemies, not as the mission field. I, I just can't help but wonder here how often in, in my own life and in your life have we had opportunities to speak to somebody, but because they were other, they were a leftist, they supported transgenderism. Maybe they were homosexual. They were someone you knew was a sinner. So we said, no. How often do we view the mission field as our enemy? Friends, I joke about this a lot. But if we listen to Pastor Tucker too much, you will see the left as your enemy and not as the mission field. They need Jesus. They need to drink from the well of living water. They don't need hatred and scorn. They need Jesus, just like you, and just like me. But Jesus is nothing like us, is he? 
That's why we worship him. Because he's not tripped up by these things. Any of us would have said, no way, man. No way. I'm not going to go talk to that person. No way. Think of Jonah. God wanted him to go speak repentance to Nineveh. And what did Jonah say? No way. I know what you're going to do. You're going to save them. And I hate them. How much does that reflect our own heart? And aren't we glad that Jesus is not like that? That instead he died for his enemies while we were his enemies. Think of this woman. She is still in the middle of her immorality. She didn't straighten her life up. She's still unclean. She's living with a man right now who's not her husband. Jesus goes and meets her in the middle of her sin. God in the flesh more holy than you and I have ever thought to be. And he's breaking all of the man-made boundaries and walls. Why? Because this woman needs a drink of living water. She's thirsty, just like you and I are. As we move through this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus isn't shocked by this woman's sinfulness. This is such a scandalous passage. Jesus doesn't say, get away from me, you're gross. Instead, he's there with her in the middle of what she is doing, offering her living water, offering her something greater. He knows that she's sinful. Friends, that's why he's there. That's why he had to go to Samaria, because there was a woman there who needed water. Let's look at the sincere proposition, verse 10. Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is asking her for a drink because he's wearied from his journey and he's thirsty. But here he addresses an even greater need and an even greater solution. It is this woman's need for living water. Further, it's every sinner's need for living water. He tells her essentially, if, if you knew, woman, if, if you knew your own deepest need, and if you knew that the one that you're speaking with was able to meet that need, you'd be the one asking for water. The gift of God here is, is likely a reference to eternal life. That's given to us through the Holy Spirit. The word gift is, is almost exclusively used that way throughout the New Testament. And it, isn't this amazing? That Jesus has immediately taken this conversation to a deeper level to expose this woman's greatest need. Immediately. Here she is, a Samaritan woman, thinking that Jacob's well is this great gift passed down from their patriarch throughout their generations, but this gift from Jacob is woefully inferior to the gift of God. What an incredible offer our Lord makes to this wretched woman. Think about the stark contrast of this event and the interaction with Nicodemus. There is so much contrast, and I would be of the opinion that it's on purpose because these stories are right back to back to each other. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Jesus goes to this woman. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Jesus comes to this woman at midday. Nicodemus, we're, we're given his name, Nicodemus. Here, it's just some Samaritan woman. Nicodemus was this outwardly religious and pious man. This woman was an obvious sinner a social outcast. Jesus speaks in these high and lofty theological terms with Nicodemus, and here with this woman, it's a very simple offer. I give you living water. Most likely, Nicodemus left unsaved and unchanged, and by the end of this conversation, this woman is in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was respected in the city, he was well known, he was sought after, he was a law teacher, a law keeper. And this woman is a deplorable, she's a law breaker. 
And Jesus is still here with her. Do you sense the compassion of Jesus, of our God for sinners in the middle of their sin? In the middle of it. She did, he didn't wait for her to become a Nicodemus before he said, you can now drink from living water. She's in the middle of her filth. And he offers her something greater. That's what our Savior is like. Nicodemus could never earn salvation. But here he says, if you knew the gift of God, he would have given you living water. He would have given it to you. He didn't come for the noble. He came for the nobody. He didn't come for the overly pious, but the pariah. Not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. He didn't come to the Nicodemuses of the world, but to the no-named immoral people of this world, to the outcast, to the obvious sinner. He comes to the thirsty and offers them living water. What is living water? Well, if we'll just let Jesus, when he talks about this again later, answer that question in chapter 7. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John adds as a note here, Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. He was talking about the Spirit. He will give you living water. It's the Spirit. It's eternal life. It's everything that God has to offer to sinful man. It makes perf just a perfect illustration for speaking of spiritual truth because all of life is dependent, whether directly or indirectly, on water. You need water to live. And here Jesus offers you living water. Why living? Why is it called living water? The word literally means uh, running or fresh water. So it wouldn't just be a stagnant puddle of water. It would be fresh water that's running. So that way it's always clean and it's always fresh and it's always refreshing. This would have been something that she'd be familiar with, at least in a loose sense. And certainly other people during that time, because there is a lot of rich Old Testament imagery behind the idea of living water. Psalm 42 speaks of the psalmist's soul thirsting for God. He's thirsting for God. Jesus, in other words, is offering to this undeserving woman that which will quench her greatest need. Perhaps this truth is a bit beyond her at this point because her Response is amazing. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Sir, you don't have a cup. You don't have a rope. How, how are you going to get water? Do you see the spiritual blindness here? She's talking to the God man. He's offering her the gift of God, living water, and she says, well, you don't have a water bottle. How are you going to give me living water? You don't even have any, and you can't even get it. You're asking me for water. She's spiritually blind, and certainly there was a time in your life, maybe even today, where that's true of you, where you're confronted with living water in the scriptures, and you don't get it. That was true of Nicodemus, wasn't it? Nicodemus, you have to be born again. What did Nicodemus say? Well, how am I supposed to enter back into my mother's womb? Do you see how we are? Do you see how in our sinfulness our hearts are so dull they cannot comprehend anything beyond just what's right in front of us, beyond what's of this world? But clearly, Jesus is here offering her something much greater, dealing with a greater need than just her thirst. It's the need of her soul. And then she has the audacity to ask, are you greater than our father Jacob? 
The answer, of course, is yes. Jesus is greater than Jacob. He's greater than the religious system of the day. Jesus is greater than Moses. He's greater than the temple. The water Jesus offers is greater than water that we could draw from any well. In fact, the satisfaction we find in Christ is greater than any satisfaction we can find in this lifetime. That takes us to the superior satisfaction. Verse 13, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. If it wasn't clear enough before, now Jesus makes it obvious that he's talking about something other than just regular water. He makes it clear that the water is an object lesson pointing to a greater spiritual reality. This woman has been drinking from the wells of this world and they have left her thirsty, yet they have left her wanting more, perhaps even wondering if there even is something more. Discontent with life, surely with herself, she's thirsty. And though she's literally walking to a well, to draw actual water from, this is pointing us to a greater need that this woman had. It's the same need that we all have. Jesus shows both Nicodemus and this unnamed woman the same thing in entirely different ways. Their deepest need is not something that can be achieved or met by human effort. They must feel this need deeply and recognize that this greater need can only be met by Christ. Oh, how many times have we humans been found going to wells that leave us thirsty? Listen to Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Not only have we forsaken God, he's saying there that his people have tried to meet their own needs by themselves. And isn't that true? That we look for satisfaction in places that cannot satisfy that we dig out for ourselves our own wells, thinking that this will be the thing that satisfies me? Friends, not just before Christ, even Christians do this. That's why there are lines and songs like we sung today, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. But do you feel it? Do you feel your own heart's tendency to wander Do you feel your own tendency to want to abandon the fountain of living waters and go and dig for yourself a well? And it's a broken well, he says. It doesn't even hold water. It's broken. We abandon living water, an inexhaustible supply, an inexhaustible fountain. When we are most thirsty, there we are time after time going to that well in the hardest part of the day when we are most thirsty, drawing from the well that cannot satisfy. There is a sign affixed to every broken cistern that we have dug for ourselves that reads, whoever drinks from this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks from this water will thirst again. Friend, what is the well that you go to most often? Perhaps there are many of them. What are the ways in which you pursue satisfaction in things of this world apart from Christ? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's possessions. Maybe it's power, prominence, or prestige. Maybe it's something less obvious like family. Maybe you've made your family the well, the source of your satisfaction. Maybe it's your career or your hobbies. Either way, that water has left you thirsty, and it always will. We live in a highly consumeristic society today. You know this. We approach approach everything with a consumer's mentality so that as soon as something is no longer pleasing to us, we move on 
to the next thing. And just like this woman who moved through five marriages and is now on her, her sixth love interest, maybe this will be the one. Maybe this well will not leave me thirsty. And she's thirsty yet again. That we do the same thing. As soon as a relationship is no longer pleasing, we leave it. We don't need that. Why do people get divorced all the time? I'm not satisfied here. You're not making me happy anymore. This is something is wrong in me. And I think that the reason is because of you. And I'm going to go to another well. As soon as our home is no longer satisfying to us, we buy a bigger one. Our cars, our clothes, even the church that we attend. What we are doing is searching for water in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Do you know why we struggle with satisfaction and contentment? Why you can't be content right where you are? Why you can't find joy right where you are without anything changing? It's because you have made something other than Christ the well that you drink from. You're drinking from something else. And you have ignored the sign that says, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. You've said no. Maybe this time, maybe if I drink a little bit more of it, maybe if I put more in my bucket, it will satisfy me this time. Maybe it's something obviously simple. Maybe it's something good that you have made an idol out of. Either way, we find Jesus' words to be true. That, that water has left us thirsty. But what Jesus offers us is something so much better than what the world could ever possibly offer. Verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How will we never thirst again? It's not that you'll never experience a desire or longing, but that we will now have a spring of water welling up within us. In other words, you don't need to go to those wells anymore. It's right within you, and it's bubbling up. That's what this word means, is leaping up. It's, this water is leaping up to the top. It's almost this sense of it's overflowing. It's a full cup, and it's leaping up and overflowing. There's more than you can even take in here. Why would you go somewhere else? Why would you go to the wells of the world? Why would you try to dig your own cistern? Why don't we come back here over and over again, day in, day out? When we drink from this well, we no longer need to dig out for our cisterns that hold no water. But instead, we have access to the inexhaustible fountain of living water. We won't cover it today, but it would be beautiful for you to read it. Go home and read Ezekiel 47 and then read Revelation 22 and see the, re the deeper reality here of this, the enjoyment that we will have of this living water for all eternity because Jesus says it will well up to eternal life, friends, from all, for all of eternity. We will drink from the fountain that will satisfy us. And Christ offers us a satisfaction of the soul that is far superior to anything that we can taste, touch, think, or experience in this world. So the question before us this morning again is what well have you been drinking from? Do you come daily to the well of living water? Or do you keep going to, the, to drink of the wells that cannot satisfy? Are you satisfied in Jesus? And with Jesus, are you satisfied in the world because you're in Christ? Or are you satisfied by the world? Do you keep going to drink of the water that leaves you thirsty? Friend, whichever you are, know this, that Christ's offer is to anyone who is thirsty to come and drink and be satisfied. And drink again, and then again, and then again, and then again. It will be in you a well of water springing up. And you no longer need to go to these empty, broken cisterns. 
He offers you and I the opportunity to never have to go search for water again. And I pray that we would respond the same way this Samaritan woman did. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the work that the Spirit does in revealing to us areas of our life where we have been searching for satisfaction in places that cannot satisfy. Lord, I ask that you would work in us. I ask that you would satisfy us with this living water so that we wouldn't thirst again. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.